Hi folks, I'm International Master John Watson and this is Ask the Master on ICC TV. The main idea of this show is to provide a forum for you, the viewers, to ask questions either live in the chat window right there or uh, perhaps even preferably by email in advance in the week before or at any time because I can answer these questions at any time. Uh, and that email would be askimwatson at chessclub.com a-S-K-I-M-W-A-T-S-O-N at chessclub.com. That's C-H-E-S-S-C-L-U-B dot C-O-M. We get a lot of questions about openings. Uh, you can ask questions about improvement. You can ask questions about players, opinions, about books, about videos, uh, any sort of things. Chess strategy, leading players, anything that really comes to mind. And you can send me games. I just had somebody send me a last minute game. I haven't had a game in a while. So I think I'm going to try and squeeze that in today. And if not, I'm going to get it in next week. So um, that's always fun when people send me games. We haven't, I haven't gotten many of those recently. And I, I hope I haven't discouraged you from sending those. So, uh, and that's, once again, that's askimwatson at chessclub.com. You can also comment below the YouTube video. I got one of those, which I was going to address today. So once the YouTube, once not right now, but once the video is up and archived on YouTube, you can uh, go below and put a comment there, and I'll usually be able, I'll usually remember to take a look at those. And I see we've got people on the channel. This is great. Hi, Alan. Hi, Steiner. Hi, Jordan. Hi, Shidke. Um, yeah, well, I could, before I even start, well, let me let me do one question first, because it's sort of a general one I got. I actually got this, oh, and you can also message me on ICC, and this came from a message on ICC, which I don't, actually, this came from a, from a question below YouTube. Uh, would you recommend in-depth opening study for someone who is rated around 1,500 to 1,600 standard? And the answer to that question, maybe surprisingly, is yes, I would. It won't really get you to where you want to go without playing a lot and without other study. So I'm not saying it's the only thing you should do, but I think it's actually extremely useful and shouldn't be underestimated. I think sometimes teachers think that their students really shouldn't be studying openings too early on, but I think there's it's, it's almost never too early. Um, you really have, there are a few basic things you need to be doing. One thing is playing. Another thing is probably a little bit of tactical exercise. Of course, your, your plane will give you some of that. And you should know your basic endings. Try and study your basic endings. I think that's important. But beyond that, opening study is also important because it teaches you a lot about the nature of chess, about positions, about structure, and maybe more importantly than anything, about timing. Because as you study openings, you start to see what kind of plans work and what don't, and how fast you have to develop, or when you can sacrifice development in order to gain some other goal, like some tactical advantage or maybe space advantage. Um, serious opening study is actually study of the whole game. In particular, it's, a, it's, it's, it's middle game study, effectively, because the openings lead into the middle games. And you get to see which kinds of middle games are going to work and which ones aren't. So um, it's also psychologically good, I think, to study openings because you don't lose these really quick games, these miniatures all the time, to players who you may be just as good as, but they know the openings better and they trick you. Openings are so complicated, they need to be studied. Uh, even a very smart player can fall for all kinds of tricks if they haven't studied the opening. Now, there are other things you can be doing, of course, and depending. For example, if you're bored with what I just said, studying end games and uh, that sort of thing, and studying openings. One thing you can do is study the great games by the great players, and that's that's usually a lot of fun. And hopefully with annotations by good players, or just annotations, period. Uh, so you can look at notes and explanations of why people made the moves they made. Another extremely useful thing, which might bore you and might not, is to annotate your own games. And that is uh, every great player pretty much has recommended doing that. It, it really makes sense. You play a game, you think you know what's going on. Afterwards, you look at it carefully, maybe put an engine on, but you also study it yourself, and you, and you try to remember what you were thinking about at the time and find out why that actually didn't work or wouldn't have worked or might have worked, and why and try to think about why didn't you play that or what did you think your opponent was doing and, and then what did he really do or what did he really want to do. So those are all little tips. Okay, so let me just look at the chat briefly before I get to a, 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 a question that I was sent. Uh, did you see Nigel Short's new line in the Nimzo Indian? I don't think so, in Gibraltar. Um, yeah, why don't you put the moves on there, Alan, if you get a chance. 
uh, oh, here we go. It went, there you, you did. It went uh, d4, knight of blah, 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 knight of three, b6, queen, b3, bishop, a5. Okay, so bishop, a5, you're right. I don't think of that as the main move. So let's take a quick look at that. Queen, b3 is not that common. Um, yes, or Sarawin used to play queen, b3. May have even played it immediately, but I think he did play knight of three first. Uh, b6, obviously not the only move, and then queen b3, which is a little unusual. It's not the main move, but it's, you know, some top players have definitely played it. Um, I think the two main moves here are a5, and, well, I'm not sure, actually. I'm trying to think if c5 is played. Yeah, sometimes c5 is played, I think. Uh, what do we have here? We have... Um, Bishop a5 right away. I think I think an idea like c5 and if a3, bishop a5 may have been played. That 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 looks sort of familiar. But bishop a5 voluntarily is a very odd move. I'm sure it has a point. <laughs> what, a, what an odd move. By the way, a5, just to show you why a5 might be interesting, it's because if white plays the natural move, a3, uh, and you capture that, I don't think there's any clever traps here, are there? No way to trap the queen, is there? Boy, you come pretty close, can't you? Uh, I'm just making this up. Interesting. The queen looks trapped to me. So maybe you can even play a4 right away. I'm not sure. That's a standard trick in other positions, but this one I don't know. Amazing. It seems to work, doesn't it? Well, I've gotten completely off the subject, and I'm also not at all an expert on this, so I don't guarantee anything here, but it looks like that works, unless I'm missing something really obvious, <laughs> which I often am. Um, looks good to me for black, I don't know. So you could play a4, and then when the queen retreats, which apparently it has to, then you can take here. And the idea is that this pawn, we've talked about this, holds up these two pawns. White would like to expand on the queen side and sort of advance all these pawns maybe, but if, but if he tries to do that, the minute he plays b4, let's make a move for black, the minute he plays b4, there's an en passant move. And then that's a weak pawn, and the, and the queen side pawns have lost their mobility for white. There's no way to advance the queen side pawns. That's called one pawn holding up two. This pawn here holding up these two. Well, that's a totally irrelevant side comment. Okay, so the question is, why would black play bishop a5 here? <laughs> well, I mean, it sort of prepares c5. He probably wants to get the move c5 in. <laughs> uh, just, I don't know. I don't know. Mysteries, mystery of mysteries. Very strange. Is that the right order? Did we get that right? I think we did. Maybe you can tell me, Alan, why you thought it might be a reasonable idea. But in the meantime, um, let's let's see. Hello. Okay. Um, hello. Hello. A lot of hellos. Any other chat comments here? Could you talk about the French advance with B6? Whoa. Yeah, I think that's uh, Neil McDonald's recommendation. I've never liked it or paid any attention to it, but I'm sure it's probably playable. Um, the only idea of the French advance with b6 is that in this position, white has one extremely good bishop, which has absolutely got scope all over the place, wherever it goes, uh, and he has one rather bad bishop here. And in fact, that's even officially a bad bishop because this bishop is blocked by its own center pawns. So that's the definition of a bad bishop, is one that's blocked by its own center pawns. Now, in reality, it's not a bad bishop at all. I mean, bad in the moral sense, because, or in the effectiveness sense, because look, it's got that nice long diagonal. But in principle, it's a weaker bishop than the other one, especially in the end game. It tends to be weak in the end game. So what Black's doing with the move 3b6 is he wants to exchange off White's good bishop there. Now watch out for a little trap here. Before I say anything else, be a little careful here. If white plays this move, strengthening his center, then that's a blunder. And this is a standard trap you, you have to learn, which is that white plays there, and then white plays check and wins a piece, and really black can resign. He's a full piece down. So um, notice, by the way, that you can't go check. Well, you can go check first, but it's never quite as clear uh, because of this move. And probably white doesn't even win anything here. Yeah, so this is just an even game probably. Okay, um, Okay. so b6, uh, but b6 has the point of playing there. You would just play another move first. One of those moves might be this. I'm not sure what Neil recommends, but I think he probably recommends that move. That's a standard idea. Um, and now bishop a6 is threatened again. And there's no really way to stop that directly. So what white does is just says, I don't care if you play that. In a way, it, it takes you extra time. It diverts your knight to a poor square. And um, it, get, it leaves me with all the space in the world. It doesn't pressure my center. That's White's reasoning. For example, maybe White, I, I sort of, 
to tell you the truth, I don't know, but maybe that would be a move because because this kind of position, I would rather be white than black. Just a big central advantage. Okay, sure, you've got a bad bishop, but you have a ready-made attack with f5. And this knight is badly placed. The knight wants to be towards the center. Even after this move, that knight should be here or somewhere, uh, working in the center. So it's probably going to lose more time rerouting and maybe not stand in that good a position anyway. That's the idea. I'd rather be white, but not by much, though. This is definitely playable. As I see in Neil McDonald's in his book, which is something like play against 1e4 or how to play against 1e4 or some, something like that, uh, recommends the French defense, and he recommends this particular line. It's, he's the only one I've ever seen actually recommend it. White, of course, has a lot of options. Uh, I'm trying to think what they might be. It might be interesting to go into some strange thing like this. You know, that's a normal move against the advance, but here it's uh, you, you've got a little extra time because of the slowness of that idea. So, I mean, something like this might be kind of fun. Something like, like, like here, or maybe knight f3, I'm not sure. Or knight h3 even, and getting castled. And uh, white might, black might try and reorganize by attacking uh, by, I don't know how we play, let's say here maybe. Of course, h4 would be nice to play, so maybe the knight should go somewhere else. But even if it goes to a normal square like that, black can try to reorganize by attacking here and then playing here and coming back with this knight to attack the center. But look how much ahead white is ahead in development. It's a game. Black definitely has a game here, but I'd rather be white, I think. Queen g4, I just made that up, but it looks kind of fun. One, one idea of queen g4, by the way, I should have mentioned, was um, it moves the queen towards a possible kingside attack when black castles, but it also uh, ties down that bishop on f8 and holds it against g7. So, yeah, b6 is definitely playable. There's no refutation, surely, but I don't... Um, it just doesn't appeal to me that much. I suppose c4 is an interesting move, too. Although it's not, it doesn't seem that impressive. So anyway, wish I could give you a better answer, but that's sort of basically what I would say. Um, ah, 3.55 at my tournament, meaning oh, the, oh, you've you're you're scoring 3.55, very good. Hello everybody, it went uh, bishop a5. Okay, hi all. That's his novelty. It was a good weekend. Need to work on my middle game. Well, I don't know, three and a half out of five. You did, must have done okay. Where did you find good? Where do you find good annotated games? Do you have to buy the CB Mega Database? Uh, either that or steal it from somebody. I, uh, Chessbase didn't hear me say that. But yeah, I think I think that's a good starting point. It's really the basic one. It's the most. It's one of the cleanest ones because they've had it for so many years. They've cleaned up the game so they're in better shape and. Um, you can you can get a database from somebody else also, um, and. Uh, there, are, you know, some people put together huge ones that are 21 million games, that kind of thing. I, I don't think that's really necessary, but it's good to have one with a lot of games, so you can check out maybe, you know, maybe you've got some obscure opening, you can still find 50 games with it if you've got a, a, a database of 10 million games or something. How well does the ready work against the Slav setup? Well, you guys ask such great questions. It really is. The questions are such high quality. It's absolutely amazing. Okay, here we go. Um, C4, C6 is Slav. And um, b3, yeah, now, now, oddly enough, people are playing e3 a lot first. The, the idea is to play b3, but this is a little more flexible. You're probably going to play e3 anyway, that's the idea. Uh, but you got to the same position in your question. Um, I think the reason, now let me think about that. Why wouldn't that be just as good? I mean, it is just as good, probably. Maybe people are a little afraid. Here's a possibility. Now, I'm just, again, kind of making this up, but maybe they're a little worried about this, establishing black very well in the center. And the idea is that if white takes, black has this move. And if black doesn't take, you know, white's, uh, black's, uh, if white doesn't take, black's got a nice presence in the center. In fact, might even be able to play the move e4 if that, for example. That might be a legitimate move. That's kind of hard to, I, I, like, I think I actually already like black here, just because it's not one of those positions where the knight on d4 looks all that good. And of course, it would get trapped on e5. It'd actually be lost, and it doesn't want to go to g1. So probably white would play um, either d3, which looks weak, or knight here. But then you've got you've got some nice choices here. I'm trying to think. Maybe just knight d7. Maybe bishop d6. If you want to get castled quickly, you'd go bishop d6. And you can even think about being really ambitious here and play f5 and knight f6. I bet black's equal here. I I, I suspect he's about equal here. Knight d7 seems like the most natural move of all, but, but but you know. Now, white can play this, though. White can certainly try for an advantage here. He is white, and he has a couple of pieces out. But that's my guess why e3 is usually played before b3. 
That doesn't answer your question. Your question was about B3 getting to this position anyway. And that's now become a very standard position, oddly enough. I've actually played this position. Um, I think it's worked pretty well. Um, I mean, in practice, it's worked pretty well. And people are still playing it. It's ha it had a period of being extremely popular at the top, and now a little bit less so, although I think it was played in Tata by somebody in the Tata Steel Tournament by a good player. But top players will still play this. I think they've lost a little bit of enthusiasm just because Black's gotten so used to playing against it. Here's one of the main ideas. One of the main ideas is that, um, okay, let's stop E5, that you, you set up a standard Slav position like this, and White plays moves like Queen C2. Um, let me see if I can explain why he does that. Blue, blue makes moves like Knight C3 and Queen C2. The main idea is to avoid the move D4, because once you play D4, you're, you're blocking off that bishop, and also you're giving Black an opportunity to play the way he wants to. Now, black, it looks like is going to play for e5, right? But it's not so easy. For example, e5 right away is probably a bit of a blunder. Well, at least not a very good move, because this is quite strong. You're threatening knight takes bishop if the bishop retreats. You're also, if the bishop retreats this way, you have knight c7 check. And if the bishop retreats this way, you have bishop a3. Uh, and then coming in on that square. Or rook c1. Maybe rook c1 is better. Let me think about that. No, bishop a3 first. And if the knight gets attacked, you play knight d6 check. And black can't stop knight d6 check because the queen takes c8. There's also rook c1 coming. So this is just good for white. Um, so what black does is castles usually, just waits. And I don't, now I'm trying to think. Here comes my, uh, <clears throat> my the fact that I'm, I'm not really familiar with these things anymore. I remember in the old days, <laughs> in the reverse position, Nimzovich used to play knight d4 here with the idea that if, if there you can go here, and then he would play f4. I don't think that plan has gained any traction. So I think these days they play very slowly with the move bishop e2. Or they might switch back into d4. You can always switch back into a d4 line, and you've avoided a lot of things black might want to do. Uh, but I think this is a popular move. Somebody recently played rook g1, I think. In fact, it might have been around for a long time in order to play like this. I, maybe it was the Vicon say, B section. You may know something about this. Now, this is the sort of thing I'd like to play just because it's fun. Um, I don't know if it's totally sound. I think it won a game rather easily. There, people have also done it. Maybe you could even do it right away on the grounds that if he takes that, this is a very dangerous position. But on the other hand, it might be unsound. So if you want to prepare that, you can prepare it with this bizarre move, rook here. I think what's also happened is white has played bishop e2 and then played for g4 uh, later. Because he can still castle queen side, is the idea. I think bishop e2 is the main move. Um, but this rook g1 you know, really appeals to me for fun. It's probably objectively a little funny, but may maybe not. You know? You're just going to try to attack. Um, what else is played here? I think bishop e2 maybe castles queenside, but I don't think so. You don't usually want to give away that you're doing this move. Not that it's a bad move, but you just don't want to tell him that you're going queenside. The later that you tell him that, the better. You, you want to hold the option of going kingside, because he might start smashing through on the queenside, and you can get in big trouble. Um, that's, I hope that's a bit of an answer. How does it work? I would say it works well, but Black's figured out ways to play against it, so it's just sort of another opening. It's nothing super special. It avoids a lot of theory, and that's nice. It avoids a lot of sharp lines that Black can play. I read books. Chernoff and Nunn have both published good books of annotated games. Absolutely. Um, you know, a good game, a good way to start, if you can find it, the Mammoth, Mammoth Book of Great Games of Chess, I think, or something. It's by Burgess, Nunn, Ems. It's the greatest game, 500 Greatest Games of Chess, something like that, or 100 Greatest Games, I can't remember. But it's a wonderful annotated collection. Almost any player's annotated book collection. Gelfand has a terrific one. Shiroff's books, Fire on the Board 1 and 2, are absolutely brilliant. Anand's is one of the most instructive, especially if you're an E4 player. Um, Anand's best games. There's three editions now? At any rate, there's at least two, a fairly, fairly recent one, where he updated it. And boy, those are great games, and they're beautifully annotated. It's pretty simple annotations. Um, there's the classics, Botvinnik, Elyak, and things like that. Um, we can talk about that. Maybe I'll do another show where I talk about book lists. I think I did that once. I've done it before in my other shows on ICC. Uh, book recommendations. But games collections are hard to even go wrong with because people are so good. You know, Walter Brown did his games uh, recently, a couple years ago, and it was an amazingly good book. All right. Um, Anyway, I can overcome psychological pressure when I win in positions. I always blunder stuff when I'm completely winning. Boy, are you asking the wrong person. 
Yeah, yeah. Since I've come back to chess a little bit and played in my older years, I've um, had, I really have that problem. I think you, you want to do blunder checks, and that means that before you make your move, uh, well, right when they make their move, look for direct winning lines. Before you start thinking seriously about the position, look for just sacrifices and uh, captures and checks and things. And right before you make your move, think, I'm about to make that move. Does he have any forcing moves, captures, and checks that, are, that might hurt me? Just try to get used to asking that question. It's about the only thing I can recommend. And as I say, you've got the wrong person there. I think, you know, my rate, rating would be much, much higher if I didn't collapse in winning positions. Uh, with time pressure. If I'm not in time pressure, I'm okay. Okay. Hi, folks. Hi, ears again. And Thylophil. Oh, we've got all the, a lot of regulars here. This is great. Chess Philosopher. Well, I'm answering your question today, possibly. Thank you. Chess Philosopher sent me an email to askiamwatson at chessclub.com. And I thank him very much for that. Karyakin and Elyonov have been playing that set, rarity set up recently. It was Karyakin. Maybe I saw that game. They're playing E3 and move two. I saw that. I saw E3 and move two. Yeah, there's a lot of this early E3 stuff. You know, somebody actually recommends. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's David Cummings that says to play it right. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see if I get this right. Um, against a Slav. Yeah, he's saying play it right away, right here. Yeah, anyway, um, that seems like maybe the most accurate order, but yeah, even 2e3, that's pretty crazy. So we're saying 2e3 against, after knight f3, okay, so he's saying after knight f3, if d5 play here, well, you could do that. I think he's saying that. Um, okay, do any of those books come with PGN of the games? Very good question. Uh, most of them, no. Those are all classic books, but um, sometimes you can find PGNs of the games online. Uh, the other thing you can do is try to get, uh, you know, this, these Everyman books by um, the, the Everyman publisher, Gloucester Publications. Uh, they have these move-by-move -move books, and those are sort of great games collections, but annotated by players like uh, International Master Cyrus Lactawala, and um, I don't think that's as much, I don't think it's as great as getting games annotated by the actual player, but they're awfully good, and, and they're a good way to study games, and those come with, in an ebook form. You can just buy them in ebook form, so you get all the games in chess-based format, and that's very handy, because you can just play through the games, you can put in your own, you can merge your own thoughts with them, you can add notes, you can subtract notes, you can, you know, so it has all the advantages, so you might want to look at those. Any Every man book is going to come in, uh, but they don't do that many biographies, except for the ones I just was mentioning. Those are, there's a whole series on Ivanchuk, Nimzovich, Botvinnik, Tal, et cetera, et cetera. Not by the players themselves, though, so that's a bit of a drawback. Who else has biographies with PGN games? I think probably nobody. You know, the, um, the author's... Uh, the, the book publishing companies, um, Dale Brandris co Company, uh, Kaisa Editions, has some wonderful classic books of older bi biographical books and games collections. And uh, Hannon Russell has some great books. Um, Hannon Russell Enterprises has tremendous books of collected games. And maybe a couple of those might even come with PGN files, but I, I wouldn't uh, count on that. So, hello, Rich. We've got a lot of people here. This is great. I hope some Chess 24 players are here. Now, why is that? Just because hopefully they know about it. Um, awesome. I'll look into those books. Surely this format has to be the future in chess publishing. Yes, it really should be. I think the problem, Steiner, so far is there's been a problem with people stealing the files and just giving them away. And then, of course, nobody buys the hardback books or even the e-books. They don't buy the e-books, and so there's no, it's hard to make money with them. So I think that it's, it's mostly copyright problems that have stopped this format from being the, the absolute key uh, way that chess books are written. And maybe there, you know, there's a lot of us old-fashioned folks that really like a physical book, too. I'm, I'm very used to the computer, but, but an awful lot of older players in my generation really enjoy having a physical book to read. They just like having it in their hands, and it's easier on the eyes in some ways. Okay, I wrote today at Bander Blitz at Jan Gustafsson uh, that this show is very good. Well, thank you. Yes, and Jan, of course, is just uh, quite a showman. He's a really, really excellent, excellent presenter. He does all kinds of uh, uh, announcements for major games uh, and major tournaments, uh, like the World Championship, things like that. And um, 
uh, Ta, a very strong grandmaster, and he does blitz. Yeah, better blitz stuff, for example. Okay, is the C3 Sicilian still relevant nowadays? Absolutely. You know, Sveshnikov wrote this huge book on the C3 Sicilian. I would say it's down slightly from where it was in the last, say, 30 years. I'd say the last five years, maybe even more, you're seeing less of it. And probably that's because a lot of it, um, you know, what's the deal with chess openings? If they can be worked out with some forcing nature, so some way in which you, the number of lines you have to contend with are limited, then people are more will, more willing to play against them and less willing to play them. So what I mean by that is that C3 used to be so flexible, it was almost considered an irregular opening. And it was almost like just saying, well, let's play chess, right? And Black had a couple main answers. There's, there's actually a whole bunch of answers, but the main answers are probably still knight f6 and d5. And those things led to all sorts of, there's all kinds of original positions that could come from that very soon you know people would play here either e6 or bishop g4 or knight c6 and and you'd get all kinds of original positions i think what happened was some of these positions began to be worked out you know to move 15 or so and and they aren't that flexible you know white can't get any pressure unless he develops pretty quickly black has to play accurately or else he falls under attack um, and that's even particularly more true of these lines you know, when I was um, Tal Shaked, Tal Shaked was a ma he was a student of mine. He won the World Junior Championship. He um, he played the C3 Sicilian, and you know we spent we spent years looking at these lines. You know, either this first or D5, or D4, and takes and Knight F3, and 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 the problem is, and you'll still see these, see these games, of course, but the problem is, is that you'll you'll see that so much of the stuff is just completely worked out in tremendous detail. I saw there was a game the other day. Uh, I'm from San Diego, and we have the San Diego Surfers, and Keaton Kira, who plays C3 sometimes as white, had a game. And I, w I was out of book. I didn't know what had happened to the theory, but they were playing some... He played some new move in, a, in a, what looked like a wildly tactical variation, and he played it on, you know, maybe move 18, 20. It was scary. And the person I was announcing with knew that. He knew he knew that that was a uh, an innovation on move twenty or something, and I, that's scary, isn't it? Well, so instead of being a kind of somewhat irregular opening where you could get a lot of flexible original play, C3 has become to some extent a very worked out opening. Now, of course, that's simplifying because black can still do all kinds of things that aren't worked out, and even white probably can too. Uh, black, you know, black can play things like b6. That's considered a legitimate move. There's also these old d6 knight f6 lines, although they've been worked out more too with g6 with that idea, and uh, just giving you giving white the center. And I'm sorry, after knight f6, white plays bishop d3. But anyway, um, basically, what point? Am I, there's also you can always go back into the traditional takes takes d5 stuff, this kind of thing. Um, the point I was making, oh yes, is that is that now it's it's sort of like mainline theory. But so if you played something like I'll just make this up, if you played something like this, or maybe even B3 or something, you're much more likely to get something kind of original and move eight or nine than you are with the C3 Sicilian. They're they're similar in character, kind of slow, nothing real threatening, probably several good answers, but but in the old days, C3 was flexible and you could get a really original game. Now you need to do other stuff to get a really original game if, and play slowly. If you're going to play slowly, you, you need to do it uh, in, in more unusual ways, ways that just haven't been as worked out and aren't quite as forcing. I mean, if you look at a move like B3 again, uh, Black has tons of moves, but against all of them, you, White can kind of vary what he does. Against C3, it's a little more difficult. Now, now that... All that said, a lot of people still play C3. Sam Collins recommends it in his repertoire book as white, uh, and he's had tremendous luck with it. He also did a DVD on it, um, Grandmaster, and plenty of people play it, but usually now it's a secondary weapon that you play against particular opponents where you think they play a particular line, or maybe you, maybe just one day you're a little sick of, you don't want to play against an open Sicilian and because you don't like what you've got against whatever they play, the knight orf or something. And so you, you play c3 partly just kind of for variety. Now, there are weird ways of playing c3, by the way, where you can play things like, um, let me just show you something like like that, and just play kind of a king's Indian attack reverse kind of position. So there's always stuff like that that you can do. Um, OK, I don't know if that's a good answer, but it maybe gives you a basic idea. Uh, what do you think of the, oh, we get a lot of questions here. Uh, I thought you were just going to say Jan did juggling. I didn't know he did juggling. That's kind of cool. I like working with a book and board much easier for me to learn than online. Oh, interesting. Okay, that's good. I, I understand that very much. You know, the nice thing is a board, 
for me, I do so much stuff on the computer that now that I'm playing again a little bit, I find that I'm not uh, I'm much better playing on the computer than I am on a board. I, it's sort of I'm disoriented with a real board. So that's another advantage. When you go to tournaments, you're going to be more used to staring at the pieces. Um, so yeah, I recommend if you can do a book and a board. Uh, it's a little harder to reset the pieces correctly, but <laughs> but it's um, a very good way to study. It's very healthy. In my show, I juggle chess books. Okay. <laughs> I hope they're light. <laughs> Don't juggle McFarland books. Okay, what do you think of the Nimzo Larson attack? Okay, all right, all right. the Nimzo Larson attack. Well, usually, by the way, the Nimzo Larson starts with Knight F3. Uh, this, 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 or sometimes this is called the Larson. Um, a lot of people played B3 traditionally. The, the Nimzo Larson, uh, at least used to be the the book on it and everybody else. It was to play this move first, which eliminates the E5 lines, or at least if he's going to play E5, he has to support it with a move like that first. So the Nimzo Larson was, for example, usually something like that would happen, especially in the old days when people would play D5 almost automatically against Knight F3. Um, but anyway, to get to the answer to your question, um, this is often called the Larson because he played one B3. Um, and let's take a quick look at this. Uh, E3, D5, Bishop D5, yes. I was just asked about this the other day. I think we talked about this. Bishop d6, and then, uh, of course, knight a3 was played for a long time, f4. Oh, golly, yes, yes. Um, there's tons of analysis of this. I believe black's doing fine in this position. Um, with um, Now, the question is, is it this line going like that, and then bishop g4 or something, or is it, um, or f6? I think actually the line that works best is an immediate F6. And there's tons of theory, unfortunately, and, and people have really studied this. One thing is don't fall for this trick. If you play, this looks very good at first. Take this and then play bishop takes. And the idea is if he plays bishop takes, you play check. And you win this and you've won a pawn and you have a good position. But of course, black has, um, is it queen h4 check? I think. And why does that work? Oh, because of queen e4, yeah. And so and so black just wins. Because now you're ready to take this. And if he plays g3, you play here. And uh, this is just a win for, for black, just to make sure you don't fall for that one. There's a lot of other tricks that are very similar to that, by the way. Um, so let me think, what actually happens here? Oh, I know, I actually came up with a move here that I like a lot, that Cyrus Lakdawalla put in his book uh, because of me. Uh, I had studied this years ago, uh, and what I want to do is play this move, knight h3. I think it's it's real interesting. If he takes, I think it's really good, because he loses all of the white squares. So that's actually pretty simple after this check. I mean, obviously, white only has some advantage, but it's, but it's a definite advantage. He has two bishops in the light squares. And you might say, well, what's the other point? Well, the other point is that he's covering that square. That was becoming a thread. And you're ready to castle and get the file. And that knight can come around up here. And in some cases, the knight can just calmly retreat where it isn't badly placed on f2. I'm getting off the subject here. I think Rapport won his game against Carlson in the Nimzo Larson attack. That's a good question. How? What was that opening? I have a terrible memory. I Obviously, I saw that game, but I, you know, I sort of started getting taking it seriously as, as it went along just to see how he won. I don't remember the opening very well. Spassky enjoyed playing black against Larson with it. Yeah, there's the famous Spassky game. Uh, okay, maybe e6 against the c3 Sicilian, hoping for an advanced French. Sure, absolutely. And people play that. Uh, I used to play that uh, for, for obvious reasons, because I'm a French player. And I played the Sicilian. Uh, I played the con Sicilian. I think I've told you that story about how many games I lost with the con Sicilian. But if they played... Um, C3, I often just went into this line, just because I found white wasn't very good at playing it. It's not that it's that great. Now, white doesn't have to play E5 with an advanced French. White often plays this way, but I enjoyed playing this. I got I got some good games with this, even though in theory, maybe, you know, maybe white has some infinitesimal advantage. I don't know if you guys know these lines, but basically something like this. You put the knight on E7. White attacks that bishop and has the isolated pawn that he's working against. That's the idea. Black usually goes this way. Although the, in this exact position, black can actually play that because for this this whole idea isn't as effective. Rook e1 and bishop e3 doesn't work as well as it does when white hasn't played c3. That's a very obscure comment. But anyway, um, yeah, so you can play e6 in that position. 
uh, and get a, a some sort of Frenchy-like position. Yeah, good point. And, and uh, I did it for years, actually. Um, I always encounter D5 lines against the C3 Sicilian. Interesting. Yeah, well, you know, objectively, it may be the best move. I always felt like white really couldn't get anything against D5. Of course, I'm not real sure he can get anything against Knight F6 either, but... But uh, yeah, it's, this is tough to actually get an advantage in this position. But if you study a lot and if your opponent doesn't know it perfectly, you can get an advantage. And even if he knows it perfectly, maybe you can get an interesting game. You just have to study it. You might want to come up with something new of your own that, you know, sometimes that's the best way to do things. Actually try to find something of your own that's going to be a little bit different that your opponent hasn't seen. Is knight c3 the closed Sicilian? Everyone seems to play it. Yeah, it is called uh, the closed Sicilian. It's just recently gotten popular again. Uh, for years, people didn't play it. Spassky used to play it, of course, in the old days. Smyslov played it. Um, this is the closed Sicilian. That's what he's talking about. Now, the normal way to play the closed Sicilian is with g3 and bishop g2. And then, actually, there's a big variety of things. For example, if black plays... Now, black has various ways to play this. One, well, by the way, one major move is e6 here. Uh, and then you just play very early d5, even if he does play here. Um, of course, white can go back into this kind of thing, too. I mean, it's very, well, white can do all kinds of things. But um, the main line, I'd say, among grandmasters for years was simply to play like that, like in a dragon or accelerator fianchetto, and clamp down on these dark squares. And then white has all these different setups. I think we talked about this in one of our shows briefly, but not thoroughly. Black has, um, I, I mentioned uh, this set. Now, white, white has various ways you can play this. He can play here. He can just develop the knight. Now, if he develops the knight there, he's blocking off the f-pawn. That's not quite as popular. Uh, so sometimes he puts the knight there. A sort of subtle move is to play this move first. So if you're going to play it anyway, so you play it now to wait to see where you put your other pieces. And you might follow up with a queenside attack, a3 and b4. What I mentioned a few shows ago was a really good setup for black, no matter what white does is playing, in my opinion, because I used to play it, is to play e5 and play a Botvinnik structure against the closed Sicilian. And I, I, I enjoyed that. I won a lot of games with this, which doesn't mean that white can't play it and white isn't happy. That can't be that bad. Um, but I, I found it as a really good practical weapon for black. And if I did any more detail, we'd never get to the things I was sent. So I'm going to have to probably stop there. I'm an Italian player. My name is Porco Dio. <laughs> okay. Oh, <laughs> it's Italian theory these days, John. Uh, Italian theory, unfortunately, um, okay, let me let me just keep going here. Okay, uh, the Italian, fortunately, uh, unfortunately, has sort of degenerated into, okay, here's, here's the Italian game. Well, I mean, it depends. There's a lot of jargon about whether something is the Gioco Piano or the Italian or whatever. But basically, this is the Gioco Piano Italian setup. And the quiet game, you know, the Gioco Piano, theoretically is with D3. And that's what people are all playing now, especially after this move. In the old days, uh, you, I'm sorry, it's White's move first. Um, so White's playing D3 a lot now. Karyakin, for example, all kinds of top players are playing this. In fact, my students, I started recommending this many, many years ago, just because the main lines are are, are sort of work, way, way worked out. Now, this stuff goes back to the 19th century. It was actually pretty well worked out in the 19th century, and and ever since then, it's been better and better and better worked out. And So this was the old main line of the Italian. I feel like White can still play this way, actually. one There is one big problem, though. Um, the old line goes like this. It's an isolated pawn position, which I think white can get more out of than most people grant. I put this in my book, Mastering the Chess Openings. Um, now this is the famous, this is a famous old line where black tries to um, repeat position and then threatens knight b6. And there's a lot of draws, a lot of short draws in that position. I think if white castles here, um, this this position, can, there's a lot of fun things that can happen. You, you can look up some books. I think. Jinji Hashvili and Perelstein also recommend playing this way in, in their very older book about E4 repertoire. There is a big problem that's come up, which is it's beginning to look like, let me get this right, this move, oh, I'm sorry, not here. Whoops, go back a move. A lot of you know about this. It, it was considered shocking when, when people started playing this, but uh, now it's just routine. But th this move is considered, it used to be given a question mark based on the idea that white plays check and then check, and he gets the knight back. The problem is it just turns out this position for several reasons, even even king f8 and queen e7, but even the main lines with d5 
which we've put, Eric Schiller and I put in a whole bunch of books many, many years ago. And then you can play a move like C5, for example. But anyway, these, these lines seem to be okay for black, and that would ruin everything because it's so forcing for black. Knight takes E4, you don't have much choice. You just lost a center pawn. And um, I don't know if anybody has any way to get an advantage for white in this position. So that's kind of ruined some of the classical lines a little bit, I think. Uh, you'd have to look it up. Now, a big expert in this stuff might know differently. There might be some new ideas, but uh, that's been a real problem. So what you see is this a lot, and that's the new Italian game. It's this very slow uh, method of playing. Now, if black plays the four knights move order, or the two knights move order, excuse me, then you don't have to play d3, although a lot of people do. Most people do, actually. But you can play knight g5, the traditional line. And a lot of you have seen this kind of thing, where, the, well, there's the famous fried liver if you take that and white takes this. But there's also just the normal knight a5, bishop b5 check c6, or bishop d7, by the way. And there's also um, crazy things like the Berliner or b5 to begin with. And, uh, or the tra and there's even the Traxler, which is this fellow just giving you this pawn. And if you take it that way, there's this check and blah, blah, blah. So the, the answer is all those old lines have been worked out in tremendous detail, but there are some ways for black to do well, it seems like. And since there are some ways for black to do well, you're seeing mostly D3 for white, which is you know, superficially boring, but then later on you can build up to get a good, interesting middle game. What do you think about the Revelation 2 chessboard? <laughs> You'll have to show it to me, Jordan. Jordan lives in San Diego. He can, he can show me the Revelation 2 chessboard. I have no idea. Don't even know what it is. It sounds like a movie to me. Um, so I'm afraid I'll have to cop out on that one. Um, oh, let me show you something. What am I doing? I've got a lot of stuff that people have sent me that I should be working on. Um, what do you play? This is interesting. Someone sent me on my messages. What do you play uh, in the French if this is played? 1e4, 1e6. Let me, let me examine that game. Oh, it is. It is already here. It's, it's this game. The question is, what about this? And this is actually a very interesting question. I think it's very instructive. It can be really instructive. First of all, every French player does run into this once in a while, but that's not really the main point. It's 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 uh, the kind of positions it leads to. Um, this is actually not even mentioned in some books. It's absolutely amazing how 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 little this is treated in books. And I think part of the reason for that is on a professional level, and it's usually professionals writing these books. I think that move bothers people. Now, we're not going to talk about that much, but I think it's a Sicilian where these two moves are already in, and you don't really get a Meroxy bind. The reason you don't really get a Meroxy bind is, I mean, if, if black has an extra move, he's going to play knight c6 and maybe even control that d4 square. So white has to get back into an open position like this. And the problem is black can play here, attacking the pawn, and then he can play bishop b4, no, I mean, white doesn't absolutely have to play this way, but but he probably does. You know, he's probably going to play something like this. And this position's always been considered theoretically just fine for black. It's very active. It's not like a it's not like a normal Sicilian. It's more of a piece play kind of Sicilian, like that pin variation that we looked at. It's not one of these strategical things where black has everything on the third rank, and the bishops back here. Um, and so the problem. So this is one reason you don't see C4 more often, in my opinion. I know I used to play the Sicilian, so I was perfectly willing to play here now. Um, but I'm also willing to play there, the real French move. And, uh, of course, that's a lot of fun. This, this is actually interesting. Let me show you some things about this. I think I have, um, yeah, let me just put this over here for a second. Um, one thing I want to say, it's interesting about the French. One thing about C4 is it's good against almost every opening that can be played. But against the French in the Caro Can, it's particularly interesting because blacks, in the French and the Caracan, black has a threat after his second move, unlike the Sicilian or the Roy Lopez or, you know, E4, E5. Um, so, so the same thing's true here. It's, it, white, in a sense, is limited in what he can do here, and that's kind of nice from black's point of view. Okay, so the main line, let me just show you the main line. Uh, well, a couple main lines, but th this is one of them. And we talked about this, I think, and maybe we didn't talk about this on the show, but... Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. I, th I think I got this feeling we kind of did. One of the main lines is like this, but white gets too far behind in development. A very good move now is just this. And if he takes this one, uh, the queen is in a lot of trouble here. I think black wins material by force because he plays knight here, and now he's threatening knight c2 check, and knight takes a6, and the queen can't retreat to a4. But how else can he go? If he goes here, he runs into this move which almost wins immediately except for check. See, that doesn't give him time for knight c2 check. And then, but then black can just go here. 
And okay, this pawn's sitting out there. It's actually pretty easy to recover, and black has a big lead in development, and white's actually going to have to do something about knight c2 check, which means he's probably going to have to play here. And that's a really bad sign. Black can play whatever he wants now, maybe even try to force the queens off. This, this favors black because that pawn's going to fall anyway, and he's on an open file. And, and also something else you should all know, I'm sure most of you do, is that this is not an end game. This is a middle game. Every piece is on the board for, for both sides except for queens. So it's called a queenless middle game, and it's the worst kind of queenless middle game when you're being attacked, which you're going to be attacked because your king's there, because you don't need a queen to attack. That's something you have to remember. Anyway, so White could also take that way, but look at all the time he's losing. This is already almost a lost position. He's just losing too much time. He has to hang on to that, so I guess here, then probably bishop e6. This is just no good. Uh, bishop c4. You can imagine. There's knight g4 ideas. There's castling, rook e8 ideas. It's trouble. So how did, how did I get to all that? Oh, yeah, so I was just going to show you queen a4 check and queen b3. It just isn't very good. Um, so d5 is a good move. What, what else can white do? White can play um, cd, let me see, ed. Let me show you ed. Uh, that's the main thing in this game. And then taking again. The idea would be to gain time on the queen, and that would be good for white. White would have some advantage here. Maybe not a huge one, but definitely an advantage. Um, so black plays here in order to take this. And now if white goes here, we've got our standard isolated pawn position. This can also come up from playing c4 in the exchange French like, um, uh, excuse me, uh, this kind of thing. And, bl and white almost never takes here because this position is considered not only, not only okay for black, but probably, you know, in some ways even better for black, or it can be, it can be better. So you gotta be really careful. It's just not the best isolated pawn position. So it's playable, but you do, usually you wait before you take is what it amounts to in that position. So let me um, go back. So the idea of playing c4 first would be to um, to take again, but don't play d4. So it would go like this. Uh, I also give in my book, I give a couple extra lines. I give queen a4 check again. Um, knight here. See, it's going to be really simple to just get developed and then play knight here and have a bunch of pieces on that square. Um, you could also play bishop d7. What, what else? What was I going to show you here? Knight c3, um, bishop e7. You can also play here. This is a good move. Whoops, sorry. You play for a6 and eventually b5. In fact, very soon b5, because white doesn't have the trick bishop takes b5, or does he? Whoops, he does. My fault. I guess here you would have to get developed first. Play here. But eventually you're going to play b5 and bishop b7 attacking that pawn. And you've even got b4 driving away the defender. So a6 is a good move. Most people play bishop d6 or bishop e7. Uh, let's just try one of them. Uh, here, knight e2, here's a game, I guess. This is in my book. Castles, my book, play the French 4. Um, sorry, I guess white's bishop must be out, right? Oh, 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 I'm sorry, this is a different line. Queen a4 is just a waste of time because you get hit with tempo. So bishop, but bishop e5 checks a serious move at least. You can also play bishop d7 there, but um, I was going to show you this one. Here, bishop, d, bishop e7, castles, castles. And here we go again with a6. See, the point is you've got plenty of time to get this pawn back. You're pawn down, but, whoops, white's move first. I guess knight c3 um, was already in, excuse me, had to be to defend that. And the idea is that this pawn's going to fall because you always have knight b6 and takes, or b5 and bishop b7. So the game I give is an ancient game where white played here so as not to lose time. Black played um, here. This goes back 50 years, this game, or something. Knight goes here to defend that pawn. Black plays here, thinking about b4 followed by capturing, or bishop b7. What happened was bishop b7. White played here, stopping b4, and black just played here, and b4 was coming anyway. And this is considered better for black. It's an old game, Grobe, Johnner, Zurich, 1941. Grobe was the g4 player, and uh, Johnner is a very famous player who lost a very famous game to Nimzovich. Um, okay, well, this, this looks weird, but maybe it's a little bit instructive. I'm hoping it's a little instructive. And the main line, I think, is really instructive, which is, in fact, just getting a normal isolated pawn here. Um, 
you don't even get the normal isolate, but if you play d4 here, you've got to be a little careful about not getting your pieces stuck in the center. This is one problem with taking too early on d5. Let me show you this, for example. Bishop here is an idea. You don't have to play that. You can just you can just get make normal moves like bishop e7 and castles. But now you're threatening c3, and black's getting castled really fast, and it can get slightly awkward for white to get developed because he wants to put his bishop on e d3 to attack. When you have an isolated pawn, you want to be active, but instead he has to put it on a passive square. And there can even be problems with the um, the, the king getting stuck in the center. Now, now, black doesn't have to play this way. It's a little risky because he gives up the bishops. On the other hand, white can't castle because of that um, bishop hanging. And he even has extra little threats, like um, let's say white did sort of a nothing move. He's not going to do that, but just to show you, there's even ideas like bishop c2 here, or even bishop d3. So it's black often gets an attack in these positions, and probably has just, it's probably about equal if white plays perfectly, but it's just awkward, and, by the, and white doesn't want to really be that equal anyway. Okay, so the main line is this. If you're going to play uniquely with c4, this is a better way to do it. Now, this turns out to be a pretty good move, but it's very complicated. The idea is to take there, play bishop f5, but it's it's a mess. So the easiest line is just bishop, knight b6, and then knight c6. I believe this is all in my game. Now, this is an instructive line. Here's a, here's a, a typical trick in these open e-file lines. Black plays check. White has nothing else to do except putting the, the queen in the way, and then black plays here, and he's threatening to double these pawns, which in an end game is going to be tremendous. So there's going to be an isolated pawn here, I mean, just to show you, this is silly, but, um, you know, I don't know, something like this. Um, White's not playing well, by the way, but but that's an outpost, that's an outpost, that's an outpost. This is a, really a winning position for black. But that's the threat. But then the question is, what do you do about that threat? It's not so easy, is it, for White to do anything? Because if he takes, he's developing black, and he still has to do something with this knight. So this position is very good. And also, black has the, the central file right against the isolated pawn. Remember, if you get an isolated pawn, which is fine, you want to keep attacking chances and keep as many pieces on the board as you can, and that didn't happen in this line. So white should play this like he did in the game, or whatever this is. Um, I think that, I think a very, a very another instructive move here is this, and you might think, wait, that that's look at that horrible pawn there on an open file. But white also has a black also has a weak pawn on an open file to play against, and pawns on third ranks are easier to defend than pawns on fourth ranks. And that pawn will have to go to the fourth rank because because black will come in on d3 or something. So this position is actually quite interesting, this this sort of thing. Uh, black might even just pile up in castle queenside and start attacking the center, start attacking that pawn. Turns out that's quite safe. And you've got these light squares. And guess what? Black's got a good bishop, right? No center pawn on dark squares. White has a somewhat bad bishop because his only center pawn is on a dark square. Those are positional considerations. But but the interesting thing about all this is it has nothing to do with the French in many ways, it, or this variation. It has to do with chess, because these ideas come up all the time. This kind of position comes up all the time. OK, so in this game, here's what happened, or in this example. I like bishop e6 better than bishop d6, but still. OK, so this was played in a game Mastery Kinderman, and he played this move which worked extremely well and he got a big advantage, but I don't think, I think it's a little early. I won't explain why, but I don't think um, it really should have worked as well as it did. He got he got a big attack after this, but actually white should have been able to consolidate and black, I think it's premature. But if black just makes a normal move like this, then let's talk about this for just a second. This is, um, and then we'll get on to something else. The, the, um, the isolated pawn, we've mentioned many times, is, is underrated in chess. My students, I encourage them to play isolated pawn positions because you get these attacks. The problem is you need positions that you need standard positions where all your pieces are really active. And to a large extent, that means putting that knight on that square so it can really move forward into the center. And so it can attack in some positions. A knight on e2 is pretty passive. Now, there are lines in the Nimzu Indian you can play with a knight on e2. But this one, I think it's even possible black's better already. He's certainly very fine, easy to play, because white has no attacking prospects. But white has no way to go forward with his pieces. A lot of times, for example, there's a bishop out here pinning a knight. Well, that, that didn't happen. So this bishop has to go to an inferior square of some sort. You know, maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe it's just equal. It's certainly not terrible for white, but but I, I just wouldn't think you'd want to get into this position as white. It wouldn't be all that much fun. 
So just to review there, the whole idea of C4 is unusual and not very good. Like I say, you can always play that Sicilian structure, and we talked about that, why it was, why it couldn't get a Meroxy bind out of that. But, but I think it's instructive to look at these lines and see the kind of things that can happen because they're so typical of other chess variations. And this happens to be one of these isolated pawn positions where the timing is just wrong for white. What he would like is to get a standard position of this sort, like that maybe, and even this isn't that great for white, but at least that's what he's looking for. He wants to put his knight here and his bishop here, castle, have some fun in return for having to defend an isolated pawn. But instead he got a position where his pieces were all passively placed. Okay. Um, oh, Elliot, aha. Ashley and Waits can try to play us the exchange French. Nah, it's actually not an exchange French, but you're close. Uh, certainly it transposed in some line to the exchange French. Would you be willing to comment on the Vienna game? I like working uh, F2 to F4 before knight G3 and go to there. Before G3, I guess. Let's see if we can figure out what you're saying here. Not completely clear. This is the Vienna game, knight c3, incredibly unpopular, which is really sad. Um, supposed to be a forced win, according to uh, Weaver Adams 100 years ago. <laughs> um, I like working at, towards f2 to f4. Yes, before knight g3. Yeah, yeah, basically the, this is the most interesting plan. Um, for example, there's the, the Gleck variation, which, uh, for all, well, Black doesn't have to play d5, but if he does, it goes like this. Again, Tal Shaked used to, we played this a little bit. We studied this and played for this. One of the ideas is that you can, if, if he does that, you've got that open b file and a nice little central push can be made, or you might just play d3 or d4 and get some activity. It's a fun way to play. Gleck won some nice games with it, a strong GM, very creative GM. Uh, the main line is um, is the old move f4, which is the one you're talking about. Now, now I don't know if you really meant bringing a knight to g3. I, you could theoretically, I don't think you meant that. I mean, theoretically, you could do that, but I think you'd you'd be in trouble because the knight really doesn't belong here. Could be attacked this way. There's knight g4 ideas. So my guess is what you meant, and, there, and you're not contesting the center with d4. So I suspect you meant g3 instead of g3. But F4 is the old line, and then the most famous response to that, and presumably the best one, I, I suppose there's options, Elliot might know, but this is the one everybody's always played traditionally. And, um, and then one of the main lines is this, and I think Black has several good, good ways to play this. The, the one Karpov played when he was young, I think is very convincing. Just play like that, and pin this, and, and it turns out you get some simplification that's very, very easy to play for Black. So this is a simple solution. There are other ways to play it. I think you can play bishop uh, b4 already. <laughs> Nobody quote me here. So anyway, um, or even just bishop e7 or something is probably okay. Or maybe knight c6. Bishop e7 is probably one of the main lines, I think. Oh, funny, I don't remember that. Uh, now, of course, there's all kinds of other famous things. You might want to make another comment about uh, b growing green. You might want to tell me what lines you're thinking of, because I don't know if that really answered it properly. Um, by the way, Elliot Winslow, who's on the uh, chat here, is a very famous chess figure who's done a million things in the world of chess. He's an international master and uh, expert in all kinds of strange openings and some main ones. Albert played that bishop before line for white successfully. Interesting. The famous uh, the one, one, the other thing about the Vienna, of course, is there's the uh, the famous um, Frankenstein Dracula variation, and also I'm sorry, there's also the Steinitz, right? How does that go? The one where you play like this, and then Steinitz used to play. Now you can just play Knight F3 here and have a normal King scam, but there's also this this famous line that's fun to look into. Amazing how many games White won with this. It may even be sound. I'm not sure if uh, I, I I don't think Black gets in a White gets an advantage, but it's, I think it might even be one of the sound, uh, actual sound gambit or close to it. Um, what was I going to say? Well, there's also the, you can play the Vienna in this sort of normal way with Bishop here, and then you run into this move, and then White has this move. And I don't know if all of you know the Frankenstein Dracula variation. I'll probably even re forget how it goes. Um, but if Black defends the E pawn, which he doesn't have to do, by the way, unfortunately, then um, White has this nice little move, threatening knight takes and 
mate, and so black attacks the queen, and now you're still threatening knight takes and mate. So black plays here, and uh, Elliot's going to have to tell me how this goes. Uh, here stops mate, and you give up the knight in the corner, but you get it back with b6. And I think even after a million articles in a million years, even fairly recent ones, I think they still think black has sufficient compensation here for the... Uh, for that. Why would you? I don't know. You're you're older. <laughs> These are the things we grew up with, right? <laughs> Is bishop c5 a thing? I mean, maybe depend on which position. Okay, bishop b4 in the Sicilian. Yeah, no, but Albert, let me let me look at that. Okay, what? Here's what Elliot's saying. He's saying a fascinating thing actually, which is. Uh, yeah, he's talking about the c4 line. Let me see if I can reconstruct that. Um, it was actually in the uh, con variation, I think, wasn't it? Oh, shoot. Yeah, it's definitely with c4. I, I think it's slightly different than the order I gave, though, and I could be wrong. I'm often wrong. But if you do get this position, okay, maybe it's not even a different order. If you do get this position, he would play knight c6 and e5. At least originally he played e5. So he would play here. And now black can play this way. And the idea of black playing this way is to get knight d7 and e5 in. Um, and I think he just played e5 in this position. I think he just played that move. For, oh, and, then, and then he gave up on it in the US championship and he played this move. That's right, He's played, he played both, originally played this. I remember I was in a Swiss system where he played that. And then later on he played bishop d3. It's just a very solid move and, and played this position. But this position is absolutely not, you just have to be the better player to get anything for white here. I think it's an absolutely nothing position for white if black knows what he's doing. But yeah, Lev Albert won the US championship and uh, played things like this. Um, you can also take this way. It turns out it's fine. It's very complicated. He knew all kinds of theory on it. I think, again, he played this way. He didn't play e5, but I could be wrong. e5 is not as bad as it's supposed to be. I don't remember why, but it's actually playable. But most players will play this way. And then, of course, black can do this again. And did in some variations. It did, did that, I think. I can't remember who exactly, but but top players have played this way for black and white. And this one's a little different. This one, I think white has some pretty good chances. White can do some things in this position. The other ones, I'm not so sure of. Elliot, you might want to correct me on some of that. Gur, the chat is ahead of the video. That's not good. That happens sometimes. That's either a YouTube thing or an XSplit thing. So I apologize. What I'll do is I'll try to make a lot of moves and the moves should speak for themselves, I guess. Okay, or maybe I should do the opposite, just do all words. Um, now, why would I know anything? <laughs> okay. uh, MVL played this C4 line against the French, and he played bishop b5 after the exchange on d5. Okay, let's, let's take a little look there. Bishop b5 after e5. Okay, so we're talking about playing this against the French. And uh, and after the double exchange, bishop b5. Okay, yeah, we talked about that. Now you can play either bishop d7 or bishop e7. Well, so I showed people, I guess if the chat is away from the video, I'm going to have to be really clear. But we're talking now about that earlier line we talked about with 2c4 against the French. And one variation, white simply took a couple times on d5 and played bishop b5 check. This is in my book, by the way, play the French 4. And I showed you a line with knight bd7. So I have to look into that technical problem because I've seen that happening before, not just on these broadcasts, but in other ones too, where the audio and the video are not correct. The funny thing is, is that the, the version that's saved by the program that's streaming is correct. So what I can do after this show is over is I can post the version where the audio and the video are in sync. In other words, the program saves the correct one, but for some reason, while it's live, either YouTube or, in this case, XSplit, gets messed up. So my apologies about that. I'm not sure what I can do about that. Um, I can't do anything about it right now. Okay, so anyway, yeah, he's saying that MVL actually played this line. I think probably more for fun than anything else. I doubt if MB MVL thought he actually got an advantage with it. I'm always surprised how the top players have problems with the French, but... They still don't play it that much. I think it's because it's so hard to prepare 
and it's a little bit, it's just not as, uh, E45 is so much easier and you do grab part of the center, it's very solid, it's, it's less stressful. And uh, you keep the draw in hand more easily too. Okay, can you switch to the Ponziani please? Meaning, can I talk about the Ponziani, I guess? We have very seldom talked much about the Ponziani. Um, the Ponziani goes C3 in this position. You can also play C3 one move earlier, but it gives certain problems. I wonder if I can remember that great line that Brian Wall came up with, didn't come up with, but improved upon. I, I'm going to look for this real quickly. It's this wonderful line, and a lot of you may have seen it, but uh, it was kind of, it was one of those things that was online more than it was in the, in the real world, for obvious reasons, because people don't play the Ponziani. First of all, let me just real quick show you what the traditional main lines are. One of them is this, and then white often um, plays queen a4. And often white will, um, black will gambit a pawn, for example, in this kind of position. And we, I could go on about that. The other main line, which is more common among top players, of course, is to play here. There's a book on the Ponsania, by the way, um, that goes through all these lines in great detail and tries to claim white has small advantages when he really doesn't. But anyway, one of the main lines now is to simply um, take here. And then white usually pushes. He has options. Uh, oh, and this is the line. This is the one I'm trying to find. That's interesting. And, and the traditional move is here. White recovers his pawn. And black plays, I think, this move, although I don't guarantee you that. And then white plays queen d4 or something. And it goes on and on. It's, I think it's just equal. Maybe white has an infinitesimal advantage. But in this position, you can counterattack with this move. I think that's the one I was thinking of. And... Brian Wall of, of Colorado, who should also be famous, because uh, he's come up with so many brilliant opening ideas and analyzed so many things and has played so many games. Here's Ponziani. It's called the Frazier Attack. I'm actually using my own book, the one I wrote with Eric Schiller, called Taming the Wild Chess Openings. It's actually a fairly recent book. If you want to know about irregular openings, we have a big encyclopedia's worth of them. Um, is this the Frazier? Yes, we recommend this as a surprise solution. Recently, Brian Wall has shown that after 100 years, black can play this way after all. <laughs> it was thought that this wasn't a good line. Um, uh, after this move, check here. They used to think that white had the better game here, but um, it turns out this move is a really good move. And the only reasonable move is for white to counterattack this way. And I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. I've got pages of stuff on this. But basically in the end, once all is said and done, uh, black does well here. And then oddly enough, white shouldn't take anything here. He should just play rook g1. And then black should just castle. Anyway, it's great fun. Um, so I, I would uh, I would say, oh, I hope the, at least my mouth is moving at the right time. Ah. <laughs> uh. Ah, no sync issues. Well, I know exactly what he's talking about, though. It does happen. It's a, it's a common problem. Anyway, this is, I think, ultimately equal, but really good winning chances for black, because white never knows what he's doing. Um, and, and white's the one that ends up defending. I mean, there are all sorts of pretty ideas here. If he doesn't play rook g1, for example. Um, anyway, this is called the Frazier variation or something. Frazier attack. C44 in ECO, and uh, seems to be sound for black. So that's a Ponzani that is actually fun. Ponzani does not have a reputation for being fun, alas. Um, by the way, you know, you can always play, if you want some fun as white and you're trying to avoid all these main lines, I mean, you can always do something like, let's say you get this far and black plays here. I mean, if you want to, you can play kind of a reverse Philidors. What the heck, right? You can do something like that and play a game. Um, you know, chess has all kinds of possibilities. You just, sometimes you just have to defer the big action until until later in the game. This is a you know this is a good move in the Philidor C3, so it's completely legitimate to play this way. You absolutely shouldn't get an advantage against perfect play, but you shouldn't get a disadvantage either. This should be a playable position, I think. <laughs> Famous last words. Okay, what do we have here? We have. Uh, I'm trying to play this line night after, oh, I should do another, uh, maybe another of my things that I was sent. Mm, well, let's stick with the chat. Chat's a lot of fun. Does everybody agree we should stick with the chat? I can always catch up uh, as the weeks go on with things that I've been sent. Um, Yvonne Carlson game, please. Oh, good luck. Like I'm supposed to just remember these things? <laughs> uh, but wait, I got asked a question. A question before that first. Let me do that. 
I'm now, I'm trying to play this line. Two knight of three. Oh, yes, insights about this opening. Didn't we just talk about it? I think we just talked about that. Um, you're talking about this. And, and the, the other person, was it you, said that this is called the um, Nimzovich Larson attack, which it definitely would be in this kind of position. And then what we just looked at, what someone asked about, was the, the line with, um, with B3. Did we finish that, by the way? I don't know if we finished this. Did we, did we finish this? Let me, let me quickly see if I answered this question. I may not have answered this question here. That was earlier. I started talking about the Nimzovich Larson, and did we did we actually analyze it? Because there's this cute knight a3 idea. Oh, oh yes, we did talk about it. We talked about it with f4. Okay, so we talked about the idea. Excuse me. So we talked about the different line. We talked about um, this here, uh, here, and this. And I, I mentioned my, my quote, new move, unquote, the one I showed Cyrus, which was this one, which I think is kind of neat. White doesn't get a forced advantage, but it's fun, and it's interesting. And it avoids all of the known theory, which is perfectly okay for black. Um, what else was I going to say about this? I was going to say that if, oh yeah, this old line is kind of fun. Now, a lot of people know about this because it's been around for 20 years now, but, but originally it shocked everybody, this wonderful idea. This is kind of an odd move blocking off your own pawn, but you're going to just play castles and rook e8 and retreat the bishop and play d5. I mean, it's very solid for black. And, uh, and then white came up with the idea of playing here to play knight c4 and really destroy black's pawn structure or win material or something. And black came up with the idea of playing knight a5 to stop knight c4. <laughs> so you had all these funny little uh, rim moves going on. Really cute line. I think this is considered, it may be considered slightly better for white. Now, I'm not sure. It might be just equal. Um, but it was played quite a bit after it was discovered. I think people were just sort of in love with how silly it was, putting these knights, moving knights twice and putting things on the side of the board and playing moves like bishop d6. I mean, it's just, just a funny, funny little line that everybody should know exists just to know how fun chess is and how often it, it is. Um, Yifan Carlson, you're suspicious of it for black, I guess. If you mean this line that I'm showing, I, I'm not surprised. I think white might be slightly better, even according to theory. But um, fun to see, though. You have to, people enjoy seeing it. Um, did Carlson play the right line versus Yifan? You have to show it. Ah, okay. Elliot knows something like that. Could, could we get some moves here? Because I actually don't remember that opening. I simply don't remember it. Let's get a few moves there, and we can take a quick look. Oh, it's in the Ponzani. Okay. God, what's wrong with me? Ponziani. I should know these things. Um, so it was in this line. They played the main thing, didn't they? Didn't they just play the sort of main knight of six line? Let's see. So can someone give me the uh, couple moves before I get to the Dutch defense? <laughs> White equalizes. <laughs> uh yeah, this is one of my one of my complaints I've expressed before is that when you talk about irregular lines, people get incredibly excited and write long things about them, and then they say that some, some weird move for white, you know, some strange first move, one h3 or something, or or they write a book about b4 or something, and in the end they're very excited because by move you know 10 or something, black hasn't refuted the, whatever this move is, and 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 the point is is that white should be able to get away with most moves, as I say, not one h4 and almost everything else and one g4 is very marginal and uh but one h3 is probably not that great but almost everything else is not going to kill you right if you play it the question is can you get any advantage or interesting pressure on your opponent um so ponzani anybody want to throw me some moves this is the carlson you have to show me the carlson uh who you found game and then we can kind of talk about it. You might even be able to contribute what you think was right or wrong. I feel like uh, that the, 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 the was the main line with that. Am I right? Oh, and maybe there was a knight d5. Actually, I'm starting to remember this now. Instead of playing this, which is the traditional scotch line, didn't someone play knight d5 recently? Was that that game? This was a game recently. And I think in, in Viconce, I don't know if it's the top section or, or the, the other one, and I've never liked this much for black, but it seemed to be actually playable. It seemed to be uh, doable. If you play here, you're transposing into um, some sort of some sort of Goring Gambit, right? Declined Goring Gambit. You're, you're transposing into. Um, I haven't played e4, e5 for white or black for so long. Uh, but basically, we're we're looking at 
the Goring Gambit where black declines it and then white plays here. And black traditionally has played this move, although I think someone proved that this is actually okay. Someone like Eric Pree, I think, showed that you could play that way. But um, but then the move I always played as white when I was a Goring Gambit player when I was a teenager, you know, 50 years ago or something, was, uh, was this move, Queen E2. The point being to discourage black from playing this because of en passant, although, of course, it turns out that's not that simple. But... Um, that was, that was the move I used to play there. So the Ponzani, that could happen, but black played here in whatever this game was. <laughs> Elliot Winslow, my black, my student's boy. Now we are getting, now we're getting crazy. Okay, so they play rook h3. And uh, since you're such a good teacher, we know that they recapture this way, right? But uh, I'm just kidding. So you're saying they recapture with the pawn, huh? Wow. Hey, the exchange is worth nothing these days, so it must be about an equal game. Oh, here we go. D4 uh, takes knight d5. You found with white. So that was the Carlson game. Shows what horrible memory I have. I I didn't pay much attention to the opening of that game. I looked at the middle the middle game because I was curious what what could have happened. Um, okay, so so it was. It's what we were talking about. It was this line with knight d5. And as I say, that that's a fairly unusual move. Um, for years and years and years, this has been considered sufficient. Um, one reason is because if queen e2, which is the most important move, I think, and someone can correct me on this, but I think here, here, f5 is considered okay. It's a gambit if he takes, but black has a tremendous number of pieces out. Probably white shouldn't take, or well, maybe it's about even. But this is considered, or used to be considered okay for black. Who knows, with computers, maybe someone's come up with something different. And if you don't play queen e2, what are you going to do exactly? Black's about to play d5. For example, how can this be bad, right? Or maybe check for black first on b4, but I can't believe this is really bad. I think I'd throw this in, actually. That's very hard to believe. Black's got too many pieces out, and he can make a move in the center. Not that white stands badly, but... Okay, so, so knight d5, uh, you can keep telling me what happened if you want to. The question is, what was good and what was bad here? I, you know, I would have been happy in the old days to have this as white, but I, I, I have no idea why. Um, I mean, I, it's probably not even true. It's probably just equal. But, um, yeah, I don't know what happened here, so we'd have to, we'd have to go. Yeah, g h3. <laughs> is that you're saying, of course, because it's such a hip move that you taught them, or because your students, you haven't been able to get anything through their heads. We're talking about that H4 line now. We're talking about that uh, Elliot students. I don't know, Elliot. I don't know if this is a good advertisement for your uh, teaching skills. But uh, he says that the, the, instead of playing knight takes, they play pawn takes. And, uh, but you'll have to defend yourself now because uh, we don't want to think that this is a common, a common lesson that's going on. Um, yeah, so, but anyway, it is, it is funny how an exchange these days uh, doesn't mean that much. I mean, here it would, of course, because White's also weakened himself, but. Um, so where are we now? Should I get to the next question? I could get to the game someone sent me. What time is it? Let me see what our time is doing. Uh-oh, oh, we're an hour and 20 minutes, is that right? I'm afraid, folks, that I've gone over my allotted time by quite a bit already. This was tremendous fun. I love these questions. Everything that was asked was great. I will look up the Who You Fan game. I'm amazed I, that I didn't remember that it was her game. Uh, but um, maybe after D5 first. <laughs> okay. Okay. So thanks, everybody, and uh, I'll catch you next week, I hope. Now, remember, ask I am Watson at chessclub.com. Send your games. I had a game this week. I'm going to show it next week. I'll probably show almost any game you send me at this point because I, I think that's a real exciting thing for everybody, and it's usually very instructive, too. So, um, you know, this chance to get some free publicity. If you dare, send me a loss, and you might learn something. Uh, I don't like showing my losses, but on the other hand, it's kind of if you, it's definitely a way of um, getting better at the game, for sure. Um, so thanks, everybody, and I'll see you next week.